Okay, cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, you're here because you are interested in learning the Helm code base for various reasons. Hopefully, part of it is to help review pull requests so that you can get the features that you want into Helm that are already in open pull requests, and there are probably about there are probably about 300 of the 300 something now. So, so we appreciate uh, your interest and your help. So, I'm Scott Rigby. Um, I am a developer advocate, uh, currently working nowhere, and um, I, uh, I'm a Helm maintainer. I have been since 2016 or so, um, when I really started working with the charts repo. If any of you remember the stable and incubator charts repos, that was really a big part of what I initially did. Um, but, you know, involved in various levels of Helm. And, uh, yeah. I, I'm Karina Angel. I'm one of the Helm web maintainers. Um, been involved for a couple of years now. I don't know, time Time is a weird construct right now. Um, and what I- What is time? <laughs> what is time? I currently work for Red Hat and Andy. Yep. Hey everyone, uh, Andy Block, a distinguished architect at Red Hat, also with Karina. Um, I have been a chart maintainer for about, for a year. Been in the chart community for a few years. My focus in the project is enhancing and improving OCI integration. So using OCI and storing charts within OCI registries is my primary focus, as well as every, as well as just general con contribution to the project. And I do wanna quickly point out that we have two other maintainers that I can see right now. They're in the front row. So if you have more questions, you can find them later too. Oh, she just threw you under the bus. You know, this, and Martin, if you don't know Martin, he was a huge influence on the three to four uh, migration. Or two to three, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Not four, yeah. yeah so, um, so we're going to start with a, uh, this is just the agenda for today. Um, most of this we're going to go rather quickly through, and we're going to focus most of our time on, um, on exploring the Helm code base in depth. But it's important to like set up a few of these things a bit and then kind of like help say, well, then what do you do next? Um, so, yeah, so, uh, so what is Helm? So Helm is a package manager. It sounds like, okay, every, who doesn't, wait, who, who knows what Helm is and who, who uses Helm already? Okay. When you, when you come to an event like KubeCon, you never yeah. know who's gonna show up. It might be their first foray into Kubernetes. Let's go ahead and let's start with the primitive. So exactly. who here has not heard or used Helm? Raise your hand. So for the people that are, are watching this recording later, just in sh be really short about it. Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. It helps primarily package applications and allows you to uh, deploy those. And it has other lots of handy features um, that allows you to basically work with the entire life cycle of an application in Kubernetes. Um, but yeah, it's also like, it really is a great way to share. Um, and uh, people come, to Helm for different reasons, but um, you know, one of the one of the reasons that folks come to Helm is to to actually learn Kubernetes to try to reverse engineer charts to understand what do these manifests even mean. Um, and we have a lot of users like that. We have other users who are developing their own charts. Uh, the vast majority of people just say Helm install blah and they never think about it. Um, and then we've got people that are helping on the development side. Um, on Helm, Helm itself, like the, the binary, um, and the Helm tooling. So we'll go over some of that in a few. Um, okay. So Helm has been around since 2016 and became a graduated project in 2020. Um, and since then, once you become a mature graduated project, um, one of the things that happens is um, you have a lot more users and not as many maintainers. So having, uh, walking through this PR process as you are um, anxiously waiting for your pull requests to be reviewed and uh, merged, um, it's good to, I'm glad you're all here, kind of walk through this and, and help understand um, that we do need more um, people to help review and um, we care triage. about we care about yeah. all of these pull requests. We just time doesn't sit still. We're getting there. Okay, cool. Um, 
Yes, so, uh, so like breeze through some of this. Basically, um, I think it sounds like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that maybe it would be good I think we skipped some slides. Yeah, just to skip a couple of these and like jump right into it because everybody here is familiar with Helm and why it matters for Kubernetes. Um, we'll like get to the meat of uh, why we're here. Um, okay, so you know that Helm allows you to install applications in Kubernetes. Okay, let's get to where we are. Um, well, I mean, this is actually probably pretty good to, to just to mention to folks, like, because this will, actually, this will help with the introduction to the code base, just to talk about the different parts of Helm very briefly or outline them. So generally, um, when we're talking about Helm, it is a CNCF project, but it's also a bunch of different things. So when people describe Helm, they, they mean the Helm binary, um, that lives in get, at github.com helm helm, or when you just say helm, you, you use the um, uh, imperative helm command, that's really what we mean by CLI. Um, uh, then there are helm charts, right? And those now are distributed. They, lo they, they don't live in one place, even though they used to live in one repo. Um, now, they, now they're quite distributed, and we generally use Artifact Hub to find them. Um, helm also, uh, the other part of helm is the helm templates themselves. Um, and they really, um, for those who are wondering, the templating functionality is, if there's anybody wondering, um, it's primarily for helping people just templatize YAML so you don't have to type all that by hand um, and allow some simple options. Um, the Helm values are those options, that the options file, uh, as most of you know, but we'll still say them real quick. Um, releases are the uh, when you do a Helm install, you can install, let's say, Bitna uh, Bitnami WordPress or any other chart, and you can install that multiple times. Each of those instances is a release. Um, and ultimately, there are revisions. So Helm keeps track of revisions. Um, those metadata, those metadata, sorry, those revisions are stored in, as metadata in secrets with generally within the namespace um, where the chart's deployed. So just uh, reviewing that, for a second, because we'll kind of get to some of this in the code base. So Helm project is comprised of several different repositories. You have the primary Helm repository, where most of you will probably spend most of your time. We have Helm dub dub dub, which is gonna be where the contents of our website live. We have a couple different tools that help support the Helm tool, um, code base. One of them is Helm, Helm testing, which allows you to do um, some test-driven uh, user sanity checking, so it does some linting. It will also do some integration testing to make sure that your chart will be deployed successfully to a Kubernetes cluster. If you're using it within like GitHub Actions or your CI, you'll potentially spin up a kind cluster, as they showed today during the keynote. Uh, 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 Helm releaser is gonna be where you, it helps make a chart release using GitHub. So if you're using GitHub, there's a automated process that will help you create a, Git rep a chart repository within GitHub pages. Easy, simple way to get a chart repository out there. We have a number of GitHub actions that help support Helm itself. And then we also have Chart Museum, which is another project that allows you to store your charts. So if you didn't want to use GitHub pages, you can go ahead and deploy Chart Museum within your organization if you happen to be interested in deploying one and stand that up. There are many different ways to contribute to Helm. You don't necessarily have to be a coder, but you can go ahead and propose certain things. So let's say you had an interesting idea for a new feature. Let's say you're a project manager and you say, hey, I got a, I got a team. I keep hearing all these issues. I can go ahead and create a proposal. If you, are, if you wanna then go ahead and perform some changes, you can go ahead and create features, you can enhance the code base. We love that because, you know, nothing like, you know, evolving forward. If you find a bug, because Helm wouldn't have bugs, would they? It's perfect, right? Those normal, it's pretty stable. But. It's pretty stable, but still, <laughs> if you find a bug, you can go ahead and contribute, issue a, issue a bug report. You can go ahead and fix a bug, please. If you find a bug, please fix it. We'll get to it. Or most importantly, like any open source project, you can contribute documentation. We love documentation. It's how others in the community learn about Helm, learn how to use it. So there are different ways that you can start getting involved in the Helm project. It doesn't have to just be Golang code. And translations, we love translations too. Now that would be amazing. If 
anyone is an, you know, a fluent speaker of a different language, we'd love to talk to you about going in and helping contribute some different languages because we want to help expand the amount of user base and putting it into their own natural language makes it easier for them to pick it up. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm gonna try to breeze over some of these so we can really dive into the code base. Sure, let me okay. just talk about hips. So basically, if you have a new idea or new feature, you can create a hip. A hip is a helm improvement proposal. So you can go ahead and you know, propose how to improve the Helm code base. And there are three different types. If you go to the next slide, Scott. Yeah. Basically, there's a new feature. So if you want to have some kind of new implementation to Helm, there's if you have some kind of information that you want to make it easier for others to understand for Helm, or if there's a way of working with Helm, that's another type of hip that you can go ahead and create. Yeah, and they're similar to, to uh, pips. Basically, that was part of the, you know, the inspiration. In, in the Python the world. Python and ultimately an RFC. But this is also pretty important when reviewing pull requests because you know, often someone's going to open up a pull request with major changes and um, generally one of, the, one of the maintainers will say, ooh, that, that, looks like a pretty major, that looks like a pretty major change. Have you, have you talked with anyone about why, you know, how this, sh what else would this would affect, um, et cetera, and will often suggest that someone open up um, a HIP, an improvement proposal. So yeah, um, I can I can cover yeah. this if you, yeah, if you want. Like there's there's really uh, several types of roles for people who are actually working on the Helm project itself. Um, primarily, uh, we've got um, uh, and, and we'll get to the why on this for a second. But we've got um, the sub project maintainer, which is someone who maintains just one uh, either repo or set of repos within Helm that comprises a sub project, like Chart Museum or like um, if you're part of the Helm, or uh, excuse me, part of the charts and chart tooling team, then uh, you may be uh, maintaining um, several repos like the GitHub Actions, chart releaser that the GitHub Actions wrap, um, chart testing, et cetera. So that's, that's a sub-project maintainer. Um, triage maintainer is one of the things that we've highlighted in uh, past, uh, past project maintainer track talks like this. Um, to say, hey, we really want folks to, uh, we want to help people, help enable people to help with the pull request and issue process. And so that's what triage is for. Um, you know, GitHub has the triage role, and what it allows you to do is do things like help with labeling and things that not everyone in the community uh, can do. Only approve people, um, like uh, run the testing suite. Etc. So only only specific people who have shown that they are really interested in this and are trustworthy and they can help just not make a mess of things um, can start by reviewing pull requests and helping on that side of things. And then uh, we have open positions for triage maintainers. So that's that's really what we're uh, the area that we're hoping to grow the most. Uh, we have Helm Core maintainer, and that's something that people certainly can. Uh, work to, especially if you're doing triaging for a long time. We'll, we'll, and we'll walk through that later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's different ways to do that, but th there's basically the core maintainer. That's the github.com helm helm, right? And then there's a community manager role. I believe right now we have one, and that is Karen, uh, right? Yay. And there's a blog post from a little while back explaining that and what that role is about. And then there are org maintainer roles, um, and those are a handful of people that guide the vision of the Helm project and help with things like governance. And really, it's just a point of escalation, mostly, for governance for the CNCF project. Yeah, I'll take it. Okay, great. Oh, it doesn't mean that I'm going to talk. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Don't worry, I was, I was going to do it. So Helm's primary code base are broken up into several sections. And I'm at least going to start with, and I'll probably turn it over to Scott, who's, who's going to really kind of dive into the different code base. First of all, like most open source projects, you have the .github folder, which is going to contain all your GitHub you know, metadata and repository assets. We then have the CMD Helm. That's going to be where our command line tooling or the command line um, components are located primarily. We have our internal package, which is going to be more the internal core capabilities of the Helm 
um, utility is found. You then have our PKG, that's gonna be where a lot of the SDK is exposed. So if you are working with integrating Helm into your own project, you're gonna be leveraging a lot of the code that is part of the PKG folder. We then have two other ancillary fold, um, just, um, parts of the pack part of Helm, pardon me. We have scripts, there's gonna be some tooling that's available for testing, releasing, all that's in there, and then finally some test data so that helps support testing because everyone loves testing, making sure that everything works as we expected. How many people actually do tests? I wanna see more hands. I wanna see more hands next time, next year. Please, more tests. Thank you. I'll take both. Do you wanna walk through some of the? Yes. Um, abs absolutely, yeah. Um, it's important to note that uh, this is something that gets confused a lot, and people that are opening PRs and trying to contribute to Helm, they want to, you want to have your feature in there, or someone else wants to have their feature, or you are an audience member who's like, there's this PR that's been open for a year, what's going on? So um, sometimes th this gets confused. So where do you put the actual functionality? Like, where do you put the feature? And the most important thing that, um, I, well, one of the most important things that gets lost often is that we need to support both um, both people that are consuming the Helm SDK, projects uh, projects like Flux, projects like Rancher, different, different projects that are ultimately just using what's under the hood to run Helm, not shelling out to the command line. The command line, uh, the actual commands, um, the Cobra commands, and they, they use the SDK as well. So they use the exact same um, underlying libraries um, as, as, uh, as you would if you were a consumer. But we need to make sure that when functionality goes into the code base to either fix a bug or improve, enhance something, um, that we are thinking about both of those users. Because the, the vast majority of users are users that use the command line. Um, when you're, you're typing in Helm imperatively, uh, or it's maybe in some CI process or something like that. But um, there are a growing number of tools that are using the Helm SDK, and a lot of you probably rely on those too. So it's really critical to make sure that, let's say, when something, when something needs to be fixed and it's not command specific, that we look at, can that be done in the SDK, probably, excuse me, in the underlying packages? Usually the answer is it probably should. Um, as opposed to, say, trying to do it just in the command packages, because then you're fixing the bug just for the command line, and that bug isn't really being taken care of for someone who's cons a, a project that's consuming the, those same, that same functionality. There's a good chance that some people, who, some of the, you in the audience, are consuming it either within your own work or your organization's work. Yeah. Um, oh, and did I, actually, would you mind going back yeah. one? Um, so, okay, so, we all probably, we're gonna assume a certain level of Go knowledge here because we can't cover that and a certain level of Kubernetes knowledge. Um, but, uh, so perhaps the internal package is obvious, but just to call it out real fast, it is things, th those are things that are not exposed to the public. And we do that so that we can, some internal packages so that th those can continue to change without breaking our backwards compatibility contract. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think that's actually it and that's on this slide that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, these are all where the, these are, this is where all the automation lives and we do need help with that too at times. So just know that it's in there and there's a lot that can, we can dig into that, but I think it's probably best to kind of like give you an overview of basically where the kinds of, where the code for the kinds of pull requests that are open are are this really is going to just contain your yeah. folder that's standard with most open source projects. Yeah. We just wanted to emphasize it for completion. Yeah. And, and uh, we do have the project pavilion. We have a booth in the project pavilion in the afternoons, and we'll have our laptops there, and we can dive further into actual specifics too. Yeah. And so, and so this is this is really where um, this is an example of um, this is where the Cobra. This is really where the Cobra packages live. So, how many people are using Cobra in their own? in their own projects. Yeah, it's a common, yeah. common tool that's used in most Golang-based projects. A lot of projects in Kubernetes use it. Kube it's, control. It's everything better. uses yeah. it. So we're just going ahead and showing that this is where most of this code currently lives. And it's a very standard structure. 
Um, actually, would you mind going back one? This is just kind of important to say. So, like, this list will keep going down. This is just a screenshot of it because, you know, we didn't want the internet to go it's down. It's super and, long. Yeah, yeah. It, we it just, it, it's all of the Helm command. So, basically, when, um, uh, essentially, everything, every, um, excuse me, inside of the command folder, there's a, there's a, you'll, you'll pretty much know where the commands are because they're named after the commands and their subcommands, and each of those have a test uh, file as well to go with them. That might be obvious for most people looking at this, but just in case it's not, I just wanted to point that out. So it can kind of help you understand, you know, where at least your entry point is for the CLI. This is the, the, the no talk internal packages of Helm, which were all of our code that we see that we can change without breaking that backwards compatibility, it's all gonna be living in here. So everything from, you know, some of the utilities that we leverage, some of the file utilities, some of the, the some of the basically just how we do parsing, as well as how we resolve packages or in charts, because that's really important. Uh, as someone who spent a lot of time on OCI integration, resolving packages is challenging, whether you know it or not. Yeah, and, and um... And just on, on that last screen, it's probably worth mentioning, there's a few things that are not obvious. Um, one is a folder called Monocular, an internal package called Monocular. That is uh, ultimately the precursor to what Artifact Hub's API does now. So when you do a Helm search, it's interact, that package is still, excuse me, interacting now with Artifact Hub, but you can also, if, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to do this, but you can actually run your own uh, monocular compatible API, um, which ultimately you can either run your own instance of, of uh, Artifact Hub because it's an open source project. You know, like let's say you have an air gap environment and you want to do something like that, you can do that and you can pass either to the SDK or the CLI a path to the URL to the actual source where you're searching, but that's where all of that is and it's just named monocular for historic reasons. So it was monocular, um, then Helm, Helm Hub, and, um, and now Artifact Hub has an API that's compatible with that. Yeah. Yeah. This, is where the, this is where the meat and potatoes lives. This is where we're gonna be the primary code base of the Helm project. It's gonna contain every single package that you probably have interacted with over time, everything from um, you know, how we actually download charts, our basic engine of how we're doing templating, how we're going in and linting our charts, how we're interacting with the Kubernetes API and CLI, utilities, how we're rendering, and then my favorite, how we're actually performing signing and verification and being the provenance folder. And then scripting is going to be where our utilities are going to live. This is, I mentioned earlier, how we go ahead and, you know, release the software, how we're doing our testing. We have a lot of utilities that are found inside the scripts folder, basic shell scripts, but as someone, as you see, there's me doing the contribution that broke uh, um, in here a lot, going and making sure our tooling is up to date with the latest changes as we continue to evolve the project. And then finally, testing, we need to have good test data. We have a lot of the different utilities, you know, from, you know when we spin up, a, when we do our testing, we have certificates that we, gener that we have available so we can do testing so we don't have to generate them on the fly and have to deal with all the fun that deals with certificates because they continue to change and evolve over time. We go ahead and we have some tooling here that's gonna allow us to perform some ge generic testing. And the test, coverage, the test coverage is really high. So that's one of the other reasons that, you know, a Helm, Pro Helm project is very, very stable software. It's not a fast moving project at this point. It's relied on by, I guess, by everyone in this room it sounds like, or most people in the room. Um, and a huge percentage of a huge number, a huge part of the Kubernetes community, right? Cool. And it's, so, so what I'm saying is that like, there are pull requests that are open and sometimes the reason that they stay open is because they don't have tests. So that's another thing that people can help do is not only help to review those, but even help to give suggestions on, you know, making sure that any new functionality for pull requests has those tests and helping to run those tests too. We'll, we'll think about, you know, when we yeah. talk about stable software, you know, Helm is a big project. It's being used by a large community. Think about a small project. You're just getting started. You can go ahead and so you can, it's a small boat. You can go ahead and turn it really easily, a nice little dinghy. But Helm at this point, like Kubernetes, is a cruise ship. 
it takes a long time to turn that to turn the boat. So it may take time for things to get in, like any large open source project, but you know, every little bit, you gotta start somewhere. It just takes a little longer to turn. A lot of people depend on Helm not breaking. Yeah. So yeah. definitely wanna make sure you that- You, you don't wanna changes... want ruin everyone's vacation. No, no. Yeah. We, we want you to have your weekends, right? Yeah, so just you don't have know to. that this is where that code lives when tests are when tests are uh, created. All of the data lives here. But I love this uh, flow chart that Andy put together. Yeah, this really talks about if you have a feature, if you have a change into the primary Helm repository, what does that look like? Well, let's walk through that really fast. This is very important. And one one thing, just so that this is a, this is a new slide, but it really is just a flow chart of what we already have in our pull right. request process. It's, so. it's, it's basically yeah. just visualizing a lot of what we have in our general documentation. So if you want to look at the docs behind this, we have this all outlined as well. And it just starts with, I got a cool idea. I'm going to create that pull request. Go ahead and hit submit. As we mentioned earlier, there's going to be a, there's a triage role that we have in the project. They're going to go ahead and review the pull request and they're going to say, what kind of is it? Is it big? Is it small? What kind? They're going to go ahead and usually label it because there are certain rules that the project has based on labels. Scott, do you want to talk about the different label types and how many reviewers you need to have with certain, certain labels? Oh God. Okay. So I, the spot, uh, I forget the number, the number of lines of code, but basically we've got a, the Helm project has a, uh, a bot that assigns sizes to pull requests. So if it's, you know, under a certain number of lines of code, it's an extra small. If, uh, if it's a little bit more, I forget how many, like what, 30 or 100, uh, yeah. I don't know if anyone remembers, but, but it's basically, it's written in our docs. Um, uh, you don't actually have to remember because we have a bot to do it for but, you, so which is why I can't remember. But, exactly. But basically, like, we've got extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, and anything above a, anything above a small requires two, right, it is above a small, isn't yeah. that? I think so. yeah. Anyway, two it requires, maintainers. requires two maintainers uh, to sign off on it, to approve it, in order for that to be um, merged. So what we'll do next is we'll go ahead and we'll, um, the triage will go in and make, or make some reviewers assigned to it, because if it's going to be a certain type of pull request, our triage team knows who would probably be more applicable, like if it's registries and OCI, it'd be me, if it's going to be documentation, it's going to be potentially Scott or Karina, by Karina, or maybe um, so anyone, so then after that, they're going to go ahead and perform the review. You know, does it look good? Does it not look good? Are there changes that we need to go back to our, um, to the user saying, you guys should make some changes? There is, okay. Otherwise, let's go ahead and let's, looks good to me. And very important, depending on the type of pull request and how big it is, you have to have agreements from the two Commit, um, uh, core committers, and then, or core maintainers, pardon me, and then finally, you have two options. Maybe even though they approved it, you can close and say, you know what, I don't think it's gonna be good for the project. It happens, otherwise it gets merged. I think it's a, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think it's a good time to mention, okay, if you haven't uh, had your PR looked at, because that's, I know a lot of you, how do you get eyes on your pull request? to get it approved, right? That's usually the big question. So if you wanna talk about that really quickly, cause we've got five minutes. Sure, yeah, um, and, and just to be clear, we're not going over the rest of the actual uh, like merge lifecycle and release lifecycle of Helm because we're focusing primarily on the triage maintainer role here, which um, kind of interested if, like how many people in this audience are gonna maybe uh, give that a shot and work, work on that. Um, we, uh, we do sometimes need to be pinged because that is our big, the big bottleneck that we keep mentioning is that, you know, there are fewer Helm maintainers now than there have been for a while. So, um, and you know, partly because it, it is a stable project, it's not a fast moving project anymore. It also is because some people have moved on to other, other things. So, um, if you're, when you're actually working on a pull request, or helping to review one. One of the things that's really important right now, or that's very helpful anyway, is to bring those up um, at the Helm meetings. We've got a weekly Helm dev meeting, 
And you don't necessarily even have to be there in person, but even just putting them on the agenda, um, we will make sure to all, look at those during a, the meeting. A lot of times, all you need to do is yeah. ping, we'll talk at the end about how to, how to get in touch with the community, talk to our Slack channel and say, hey, I can't make it, I threw it on the agenda, just make sure you go ahead and talk about it, here's a quick little overview about it. Yeah, you shouldn't have to, it's not an official part of the process, but um, be, because there's only so much time right now for, for core maintainers to, to look at these pull requests and to not just look at them, but to actually like go through all the steps to ensure that what needs to happen happens and before they, before they get merged, um, we are at this point relying often on people to be a little bit of a squeaky wheel. So, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't have to be, you know, uh, so you don't have it, to beg basically, so but you if just, you just want, give it, a ping. You know? If you want to become yeah. a helm maintainer, you know, we all have aspirations. Um, here are the steps that you need to go through. You are a general community member. This is going to be most of the people here in the audience. You're a general community member. You can then first be a pull request reviewer because you're just, you don't have to be a maintainer or a triage member. You can just say, hey, I went ahead and reviewed it. Anyone can do it. I put it down. I tested it. It was good. Then we then elevate to becoming a triage maintainer. After you go ahead and you perform the action for a while and you like it and you're good at it and the core maintainers really see you're doing a good job, they'll put you up for vote to become a core maintainer. We have a couple recent votes out there right now. So there are people who are becoming core maintainers. And then finally, you can become a core maintainer. I love being a core maintainer. It's one of the things that makes me excited to get up in the morning is to be able to look at the code base and look at my email and look at the flood that I have from all the issues, pull requests and comments that have come in overnight. And then finally, as, I, as Karina mentioned, and we have a couple of the higher up governing ones, especially if you spend time in the project, you become then an org maintainer. Mm -hmm. So finally, how do you get engaged with the community? We have GitHub, that's gonna be a primary way to get in touch with the community because you know we're all doing code, we comment in there, we interact. We have uh, Kubernetes Slack, we are on three different channels. We have the two primary ones we work on is gonna be Helm users and Helm dev. And then there is a charge one just for mainly legacy purposes. We have a weekly calls Thursday at 1630 UTC. And then finally we have our mailing list and you can talk to us there. And just like that, I think we're dead on time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and please, please uh, come by the Helm booth. We will look at the code base with you more in depth yep. than we're able to do in this short session. But, um, but please do that. If you're, if you're interested, of course, um, don't well, feel well, in any way shy to ask. And, and one thing we are do, we're gonna start thinking about doing is our Helm maintainers and core contributors are distributed across the world. We had, a, we had one very, very successful session in New York City last summer where we actually went through this process with you. We're looking at kicking that back off in a number of different cities coming forward. So if you're interested, we're gonna probably have a few meetups. We're probably gonna coordinate with some of the community days and Kubernetes to try to get out in the community. So be on the lookout for that so we can get in, you can learn about that even further after this week here in, uh, in Amsterdam. So thank you very much for joining us today and looking forward to your contributions.